Thanks, B. Welcome to my talk under pressure, how to build up resilience and keep burnout at bay. This is obviously not going to be a technical talk, but it's going to be a talk for people in tech. In today's workplace, the relentless pace often makes us miss the fact that we are running lower and lower on energy. It's a bit like the proverbial frog not noticing that it's getting boiled. I mean, look at this. I love the carpentry skills, but I'm not sure if people noticed the irony uh, in putting hamster wheels into offices for better health. Now, I'm not an expert in mental health, and in this talk I'm only sharing my own experience with burnout, uh, both of employees and myself, and what I've learned how we can build resilience, manage pressure, and stop stress. A little bit about me. My name is Jochen Lillich. Chef Brand did that. Almost did get it almost right. I'm at GWIS on Twitter. I'm the founder and CTO of Fry Steel IT Limited. And from the uh, company name, you can probably tell that I'm German. And I live with my wife and kids near Dublin in Ireland. As Chef Brand said, I like building and collecting mechanical keyboards. That's an interesting and um, easily expensive hobby. And um, I enjoy being a member of the Live Coders team. I am streaming uh, multiple days a week as Full Stack Live. Before we get into resilience, um, let me check my, my microphone just a minute. Uh, I'll be right back. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm streaming two audio streams. That shouldn't be the case. Sorry for that. I'll be right back. Okay. Better now? Okay, let's try and continue. Before I get into what resilience is, let me tell you what it isn't. Resilience isn't ignorance. And it's not about um, ignoring our issues or even pretending they don't exist. Resilience is about knowing the symptoms of burnout and having methods in place to counteract them. And in his book, Powering Through Pressure, Bruce Howard lists six categories of resilience that you can work on and develop. And uh, I'll get into these in a minute. There's purpose at the center, positive realism, relationships, self-management, self-awareness, and determination. But before I get into the details, let me tell you a story from my corporate past. In an earlier job, I led a team of highly skilled IT specialists. And if I'm blunt, one of these people made me regret becoming a manager. I was not prepared for the amount of pushback, even hostility, that he put up against me. And it became clear to me quickly that he was burned out, but I simply didn't know how to handle this. And if I'm honest, when he finally quit, I was happy for both of us. 
After I had left the company about a year later, he sent me an email, and uh, here are some paraphrased excerpts. He opened with, Next week it's going to be a year that I left the company, a good point in time for a retrospective. It was the right step for me to leave, and in hindsight, long overdue. I have a motto that helps me with uh, dealing with difficult situations, and it goes, love it, leave it, or change it. And sometimes leaving is the only option, and it's the right option. He said, I'm now 75 to 80% of the way to full recovery, but the last meters are the hardest. People with whom I'm still in touch say I'm substantially more calm and relaxed. But can you notice that even after a year, he had still not fully recovered from his previous work experience? I can't imagine the hell he was going through back then. He goes on, my boss is doing an anti-stress program with me because the old nervous flutter still comes back very easily. That's the, late, the last major to do. I think you wouldn't recognize me. So at last, he seemed to be doing much better. He then continued, Only recently I found the ability to look at what happened three years ago with the required distance. I was about to burn myself out for the company without any appreciation by our leadership or customers. So from his perspective, the company was willing to sacrifice people's health so the higher-ups could delude themselves that everything was okay. He went on, the doctrine that we were the cream of the crop, equipped to save the world day after day, steered me right into the wall. And I was stupid enough to even floor the gas, because I thought that's what I'm getting paid for. And that's uh, a typical experience, um, hero culture is very prevalent in tech, especially in engineering. There are many reasons for this. One reason being an irrational trust in the growing power of our tools. And another might be simply male stereotypes. He remembered... Maybe you remember our first talk in the new team in which I blamed you for my nervous breakdown a few months before and I told you that I considered you partly responsible, responsible for my condition. And I kept treating you accordingly in the following months. And yes, I can confirm it was a rough start to an even rougher collaboration. But then he writes... Today I have to admit that I was wrong. I felt I was fighting with my back to the wall for my existence and ultimately for my life. I couldn't find a way out of, out of this spiral and only had you and my wife as scapegoats and pressure valves. At this point, I'd like to note that burnout is a vicious thing. It not only destroys people, but also the relationships they need to break out of it. Burnout is like a parasite that cuts off your support lines. Then he writes, I regarded burnout as a problem, not a mental health issue, as did the company, by the way. And that's another misconception that's typical for engineers. We often tell ourselves, where there's a problem, there's an algorithm to solve it. And sometimes there isn't an algorithm. There need to be other approaches. He ends with, my behavior towards you was terrible, regardless of the reasons. I regret how I treated you and I'd like to apologize. I hope I didn't damage you in some way. And I really appreciate him for telling me that. And I think it gave closure to both of us. And finally, he says, thanks for all your efforts. Back then, they didn't take effect, but today I can appreciate their value. Thank you. And I'm happy about how this ended, but I'm afraid that struggles like this happen all too often. 
and that's exactly the motivation of my talk. So let's talk about burnout. Burnout doesn't set in overnight, but there are subtle symptoms that you can notice that you are on your way to burning out. For example, you might have poor focus, you might catch yourself um, procrastinating a lot, and you simply notice how your productivity has dropped. I can certainly say that about myself in this whole COVID-19 um, situation. I've been working from home for 10 years now, and I thought I'd be perfectly equipped to keep my productivity even during um, this social isolation. However, I did not ever reach my normal level of uh, productivity ever since this whole mess started. Or you might notice physical discomfort, back pain, literal pain in the neck, things like that. You might have an increased susceptibility to illness. At the end of my corporate job, I went on a three-week vacation. However, I spent the first week of this vacation in bed with a fever and headaches. So it felt like a flu, but I didn't have a cough. I didn't have uh, any sneezing, nothing like that. I just felt completely destroyed and weak. And after about a week, uh, that went away and I went on my vacation and um, yeah, I was good. A bit later, I left the company and started my own business. And when that took off and um, orders started flooding in, suddenly my fever was back. And then I knew that's not the flu, that's my body telling me that I need to take a break. Another symptom is emotional unavailability, when things just don't seem to matter anymore. And that's dangerous. This mental distancing might cause you to cut yourself off from the help that you are going to need. And there might even be some kind of a mental downward spiral where you lose hope. So there is a whole spectrum to burnout. There are different stages of how things affect us negatively. When you're leaving the green zone, you're starting off with the challenge stage. If that gets worse, you'll get into the pressure one, which will or can lead to stress. And if you're really unlucky, it's going to lead to distress. Challenge isn't too serious. You might notice you're not sleeping as well as you uh, used to be. It's easy to get emotional. There might be problems uh, being productive. You might feel low on energy or impatience and frustration. At that stage, you can still um, take things into your own hands. You might want to reduce workload and delegate, or just put up your legs, get more sleep, take more breaks. Just make sure that you can recharge. While you can still rely on your own coping strategies, you need to be aware of continuous periods of challenge because that will lead you into the pressure stage. In the pressure stage, you will experience physical, emotional and mental issues. And I'm uh, not going to read everything to you here. At that stage, you can still rely on your own resilience and the support of others. And people um, react differently to pressure. 
Some react stubborn and bloody-minded, telling themselves, I don't do stress. I just need to keep on going. Others are of the more mindless and ignorant sort, telling themselves, it will go away. No big deal. But the best reaction is the self-aware and enlightened one where you tell yourself this is not right. It's time to make some changes. Because if you don't, that will lead you into stress. Where things get worse. Headaches turn into migraines. Colds lead into flu, bronchitis and things like that. And um, it'll also have behavioural changes that tell other people clearly that you're not in a good place. At the stress level, your own resources will probably be insufficient to deal with demands and you will have to rely on expert support. Now, you'll notice that um, we are already in the red zone, however there is one more stage and I sincerely hope you'll never get into this final stage of distress because that's when both physical and mental health are going to break down. Now, let's talk about what we can do to not get there. As I said, there's purpose at the center of resilience. And with that, I mean having a sense of purpose. You are more than your work. You are a mother or a gamer or a runner. And uh, that's the things you identify with. And reminding yourself of what you are, what you want to be in the world, is an important thing to have both legs on the ground and um, be resilient. Bruce Howard said, the stronger your sense of purpose, the better equipped you are to handle challenges and setbacks and to recover from them. A clear sense of purpose will help you stay focused on the things that are important in the long term. So ask yourself, what are your goals, your long-term goals, your medium and short-term goals? What are the directions you want to take in life and in your work? How do they fit with others? Which activities get you nearer to your goals, which activities don't? I, for example, make daily plans what I'd like to get done during the day. I set myself weekly goals that I'd like to achieve when the weekend comes. And um, about twice a year I go onto a personal retreat where I book myself into a hotel for two days to plan the things that are more long term. I'm sorry if the, the audio problems still persist and um, if the production team would like me to, to check things, um, I can uh, try and do that. Let me see if I can restart my audio stuff.
let me know how this is. Okay, let's continue to another element of resilience, and that's relationships. Relationships are always important, but especially if the pressure is mounting, you really need to rely on the people around you, the people close to you. Ben Steen said, personal relationships are the fertile soil from which all advancement, all success and all achievement in real life grows. On the flip side, relationships that don't work can be the worst source of difficulties and anxiety. So make sure to um, associate with the right people. Another element is positive realism. Now, I think we all know what optimism is. It's believing that things will turn out okay, and pessimism is thinking that things will go wrong. But what is positive realism? Well, positive realism is that you believe that anything can happen, and that you know that it often doesn't. Another element is determination. Knowing what you want and where you want to be is important to be resilient. So be determined, but remain open-minded. Don't get stubborn. And look for the solution and not the challenge. Then there's self-awareness. And I'm not going to use the M word that's um, used a lot of time in uh, mental health talks. But there's a nice method when you realize that you feel the pressure and that's the stop method. It means to actually stop, take a breath, observe what's happening around you and with you, and then proceed. Simply clear your head and um, take a step back and analyze the situation and uh, what options there are. Self-management is another important part because it lets you first release pressure, then take action, and then change your mindset about things. These are the three steps that help you power through pressure. So, how do you release pressure? There are many pressure valves that people can use, and it'll depend on your personality, what you can do. For example, you can verbalize emphatically that you are dissatisfied with the situation. Other people uh, take to sports, they can talk to an expert, or um, simply shift down a few gears. You can go to a rave. You can break a record in uh, stroking your cat. You can simply take a few naps. And you can take yourself somewhere else. And with some your, somewhere else, that could mean going on a vacation. But I leave that to your own interpretation. You can then take action. If your pressure comes from time constraints, planning and communicating to people is an important part. Be specific about expectations, both what you expect from others and what they can expect from you. And going back to my motto of love it, leave it or change it, Focus on what you can actually change, and not what you can't. By the way, the monkey on your back that I'm referring to here 
is an old management metaphor for responsibilities that quickly switch owners. You might remember a situation where a friend or a co-worker comes to you with an issue and an hour later you find yourself saddled with it. Now you have the monkey on your back. Then, and I know this from experience, there's relationship pressure. It's not all roses, so be clear about expectations and um, if there is a conflict, tackle it. There are different approaches for different people, but um, I, I, I would say that empathy should always be at the center. If you go into a dialogue, be constructive. And um, there's a saying, hearing is through the ears, but listening is through the mind. If you practice, practice active listening, which means um, nodding and confirming that you are listening, don't use that time to prepare your next argument, but also um, really listen to what the other person is saying. There are many approaches to that. Um, there's, for example, the approach of nonviolent communication, or there's also something called transactional, uh, uh, transactional analysis. These are um, models that help um, conflict management, and uh, there are books about that. And then there's a slide for the managers. If there is change, and there is always change, then make that change manageable for your people, for your team. Right this time, there is so much change in companies who send their people home to work from there um, with people not knowing what, ex what is expected from them and how they should manage um, working from a home full of kids or uh, full of um, uh, responsibilities. Change is always a crisis. This crisis can be tiny or it can be large. And that, in part, depends on managers who inflict this crisis on their people. The final step is change your mindset. William James said, The greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. It's us who think these things, and we determine what we think about things. Many times it's not the challenge itself that affects us negatively, but the beliefs we have about the challenge. For example, take misbehaving children. You can think that they are undisciplined or disrespectful, which will probably create an angry re uh, reaction. Or you can think that they are still kids and that, that they are testing boundaries and um, making this a game, and that might trigger a more gentle reaction. Perfectionism is another thing. What you think about what good work looks like will determine how much pressure you put on yourself. There are well-known practices to good thinking. Some are very old, for example, the philosophy of Stoicism, and some are contemporary, like, for example, the Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy, uh, short uh, REBT. If you um, get into a negative belief cycle, that's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy, where you think, well, I'm not good at presenting to people, and you notice your internal re reaction when you are on a talk, and that might disrupt your performance, and um, then you might read chat and notice, well, everyone is noticing, and that then confirms your negative belief which is going to be a vicious circle. 
But it's you who can turn this into a positive belief cycle, where you focus on the things that you are good at, where you um, notice that uh, not everything is going wrong and that um, you're doing a good job, where this actually gives you drive and um, people notice and um, act encouraging, which then confirms the positive belief. It's up to you. So let me summarize things with the six core elements of resilience again. Think about your purpose in life, your purpose at your company, and let that guide you. Develop positive realism, where you know that anything can happen, but most of the things that you can imagine will not come true, both the positive and the ne negative ones. Build on relationships that can help you uh, steer through difficult times. Practice self-management combined with self-awareness to improve your own situation. And always be de determined and uh, be aware and sure that this too shall pass. If you'd like to learn more about these things, there are a few books that I can recommend. I've already mentioned Powering Through Pressure. Then there's another book named Stronger. A book named Slack, Getting Past Burnout, Busy Work and the Myth of Total Efficiency. And Slack doesn't refer to the chat software. It's about leaving space, leaving buffers, where you can actually, uh, where you actually have wiggle room in difficult situations. I've mentioned nonviolent communication, and I can recommend uh, a nice, easy to read book about stoicism, a philosophy that I really enjoy. And that's been my talk. Thanks for watching. You can find these slides on Speaker Deck, and if you'd like to reach out, simply tweet me at GWIS. Thank you very much. So there are a few questions. The Flying Dev says, just to say this is a pretty cool talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Me working full-time shift work as a flight attendant and spending every little three minutes coding did lead to burnout earlier last year and took me so long to bounce back. Yeah, it happens to the best of us. Um, and I think um, it's important simply to notice when things get worse and uh, that you have some strategies that you can rely on to steer you back into a more healthy direction. I am not myself, writes, anyone who works as a programmer eventually has to learn how to deal with burnout. It is a cycle of ups and downs as a career. Yeah, you are very right. And um, simply recognizing that and um, preparing yourself for these things is uh, a good strategy. I think resilience is not about never being affected by these things. It's more being able to deal with them. And sometimes you can do that yourself. Sometimes you need to rely on others to help you through that. And um, for in some situations, it might actually mean um, talking to a therapist. And that's nothing to be ashamed of. There's a question. 
but it's a technical question. Okay, um, so as a non-technical startup founder, what would you recommend when looking for either a technical um, chief financial officer, chief technical officer, or a solid team of developers? Um, that certainly depends on uh, uh, the situation you are in. Um, I think you can grow your team quite a bit um, before you need to have um, layers of management in there. Um, you should have someone who can lead a team, and that might be someone like a CTO um, or a VP of uh, engineering or something like that. Uh, but um, be, aware, be wary of overhead there. A solid team of developers is certainly the thing that you need the most in, in the beginning. And if you are the non-technical startup founder, you might also take on the uh, CFO role, or you could simply rely on um, an external accountant or someone to, to guide your financial directions. Um, I would actually um, look for a technical co-founder and um, then start growing the dev team. It all depends on uh, if you are a more of a generalist or if you are very spe specialized. Um, so uh, it's hard to give a general answer uh, that is more specific. Thanks for the great feedback. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that uh, you enjoyed the talk, even though uh, something on the technical side seemed to have been off. I hope it didn't take away too much of the talk. Sleepex asked, question, due to COVID-19, my team started working from home and my productivity has gone down. I just don't feel motivated to build software right now. Do you have any tips on being motivated while working at home as opposed to an office? So I mentioned that my productivity has never peaked since COVID-19 um, set in. Um, even though I thought I would be perfectly equipped to simply carry on. But let's be honest. There is something out there that kills people. It's not shambling corpses, but there is something. Uh, something that we can't even see. Maybe shambling corpses would be the better option. Um, and that's at the back of your mind. That's in your subconscious, and that will affect your performance in at work or, or uh, elsewhere. And um, so I think being emph emphatic with your team and with yourself is so important right now. And uh, uh, actually acknowledging that we all are not at uh, the height of uh, our achievements and uh, that this is simply about staying healthy, staying safe, and getting through this. And then we can power again and um, uh, pull our all-nighters or whatever is, is necessary. Not that I would uh, recommend that, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, just uh, acknowledge that this is not a normal situation. So it's 
okay to not act normally. Be empathic with yourself and with others. All right, folks, I guess um, this is it. And um, I'd like to thank you for watching and uh, have fun with the rest of the Live Coders Conference. Cheers.